This is Jennifer Llewellyn, Nursery and Landscape Specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, which is a lot of words, so we like to say OMAFRA. And today I'm going to be talking to you about gypsy moth. And you can see on my title slide here a bunch of male gypsy moths that are very much attracted and flying towards that flightless uh, female in the top left corner. And she's, she's a, a lot more robust in the size of her body because she's carrying eggs. And I just put my photo on uh, the top corner of the slides here. I find that when I record video um, with my camera that the video recording of me speaking often blocks uh, an important part of this slide. So I've just done it this way. And at least you can see my picture so you can see what I look like and it's a little more personal that way. So at OMAFRA, there's about 45 crop specialists, and we cover crops like horticultural crops, field crops, livestock, and everything in between. So there's a whole team of us, and we often work together behind the scenes, and it's a really wonderful place to work. I think you could ask anyone, and they would say the same thing. What a fantastic group of people. So we provide a lot of resources at the ministry and uh, a lot of us produce cr crop protection guides for our various crops. So in the case of nursery and landscape plants, we have OMAFRA publication 840 and the new edition is going to be available online this spring. It's a free PDF file that you can download have on your device, your computer, or you can have it printed at your local local office printing supply place. And, and you'll have that way you'll have access to a hard copy for your truck, um, your vehicle. And these are amazing reference tools. They cover all the major insect pests, diseases, um, and issues that can be found on really common nursery and landscape plants and for this book it, it uh, mostly focuses on trees and shrubs so production as well as maintenance. The companion guide of course is OMAFRA publication 841 the guide to nursery and landscape plant production and IPM so this is more the the static long-term uh, biology nutrition soils cover crops irrigation so integrated pest management for some of the plant health issues that, that we see on nursery and landscape plants. And there's lots of great plant phenology indicators and IPM information on there for you as well. So if you search OMAFRA publication 841, you will come up with this guide. It's a free PDF file. Again, you can download and have printed as well. So, we also have web pages. So in the case of nursery landscape plants, there's the onnurserycrops.com blog, and it's just full of photos um, and videos and, and links to a lot of really great information. Again, focusing mainly on the plant health issues that you would find on nursery crops and also on landscape plants. And you can also find me on Instagram by the same handle on nursery crops. So you can also find lots of great uh, webinars, presentations from OMAFRA specialists on the OMAFRA YouTube channel on hort crops. And some of you might have found my presentation on there. Um, but probably a lot of you are just going to be directed over by the link in an article or an email or, or perhaps my blog. But now you know that on hort crops exists. So have a look there because there's lots of great videos um, that would be really helpful for anybody who's growing horticultural crops, especially in Ontario. Another great resource that we have for anybody who's uh, growing or maintaining nursery and landscape plants. Again, mostly focusing on trees and shrubs, so woody plants. This is our app called Bug Finder, and Bug Finder is all one word. And you're gonna be able to find it on Google Play, on the Apple App Store. This is a free app that was developed um, in partnership between OMAFRA, Landscape Ontario, 
and then our our private um, entomology educational company DKB Digital Designs. So this is an amazing app, and actually we've we uh, recently had a look, and there's over 20,000 downloads for Bug Finder, which is fantastic. So check this out; it's an amazing resource. It's going to really help you if you're out there scouting for pests, for insects, mites. It's uh, got 82 species of the most common insect and mite species you'd find on outdoor ornamentals, on, on woody ornamental plants, both in the nursery and in the landscape. So just really quickly, Bug Finder is really easy to use. You just need to know two things. So you need to know the kind of plant that it is that you're scouting or, or monitoring, looking at, examining for some insect or, or mite issues. And then once you click on that, you then can sort of choose where you are in time. So Bug Finder is laid out according to growing degree day ranges. And what it's going to do, it's going to put you into a growing degree day range according to the date on your device. So if you want, you can just go with that and click next. Now, if you wanted to fine tune that a little bit, you can actually look at some of the common plant phenology indicators that are out there in the landscape or the nursery at this time and see if that fits with the growing degree day range that bug finder has you in and if it doesn't and you're a little bit more head you can click on that red thermometer and if it doesn't quite fit maybe you're you're a little too far advanced you can click on that little blue thermometer and then you can go ahead and Bug Finder is going to show you all the pests that would be commonly found on that plant and correspondingly what they would look like at, the, at this time. So you look at that and you say, okay, there's gypsy moth egg masses. That's, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, I'm going to click on that. And then Bug Finder is going to give you lots of information relative to gypsy moth and how to scout for it, how to find it, what to look for, um, some management recommendations and host lists and stuff like that. So it's a really amazing resource. So do check that out if you don't have that on your phone yet. I think this is something that you're going to want to want to have for this year. And it's the reason it's a bit of a download is because it's full of high resolution color images that you can actually zoom in on on your phone. So it's a, a bit of a download, but it is well, well worth it. I can promise you. And you can also search by pest. If you know what the pest is that you're looking for, you can also search by pest on Bug Finder. So here's myself and Dave Chung from DKB Digital Designs. Um, Dave's also a, a graduate from the University of Guelph and he does a lot of amazing projects and I wanted to show you one of his most recent projects is called Bug Dex, again all one word, and this is an interactive identification app to all the insect orders, or maybe not all the insect orders, but the most um, common insect orders of the world. So no matter where you are in the world, this is relevant. Bug Dex is actually relevant to the insects that you're looking at. So this is a, a very incredible, unique, powerful resource that again is going to be available free to everyone coming spring 2021. So have a look. Bug Dex is also online on Instagram. Uh, you can follow the Bug Dex um, channel as well and uh, find out exactly when it's going to be published. But this is a, an amazing resource that we have coming. But we are here today to talk about gypsy moth, uh, Lymantria dispar dispar, and it's in the family um, Arabidae. And you can see it's actually, you know, up close. Um, and here's a, this is a photo from Dave Chung from DKB Digital Designs. But you can see how beautiful it is, actually so colorful um, when you take a closer look um, with all the definitions and the hairs. And you can see how it's got five pairs of blue dots 
on its back, on the dorsal sur uh, surface of its back, and then followed by six pairs of red dots. But you can see all the, the hairs coming out of the body of the caterpillar, and that's significant as well for its ID and some other reasons, which we'll talk about. And just so you can see gypsy moth, what they look like from the dorsal surface or from the, the back, that's the pattern that you're going to see. And these are older instars, so more mature larvae. So you can see that patterning, it's quite distinctive. But when they're young and they're first hatched, they just like look like black, kind of fuzzy looking caterpillars and, and can be hard to distinguish between them and some other species. So here's some other caterpillars that we would encounter potentially in the Ontario nursery, in the Ontario landscape for sure. So on the left hand side, you can see forest tent caterpillar and we sometimes uh, will say white step, footsteps in the forest. So you can see the, the kind of white footsteps along its back to sort of help you remember that this is okay. This is forest tent caterpillar. And then on the right hand side, we have Eastern tent caterpillar with that solid white stripe down its back. So I just wanted to show you these two species because they would probably be the most commonly confused with the gypsy moth. So gypsy moth is a regulated pest in Canada. This is a, a map of the regulated areas of gypsy moth in Canada. It's from the CFI website, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency website at www.inspection.gc.ca. You can find all of their information and you can search by the way, by gypsy moth, common name, Latin name, or whatever you need in terms of resources. But you can see that it's in very much of Southern Ontario. And then once you cross into Northern Ontario, um, it, it's actually not infested in Northern Ontario. So if you are shipping plants from the South to the North, that's a, a really good thing to know since I'm sure they, they do not wish to have gypsy moth. And in Quebec, um, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI. So these are all considered to be infested areas, whereas Newfoundland and Labrador are, are not. And then once we get into Northern Ontario and to the West, also not infested. Again, it's important to know where gypsy moth is in Ontario and where it's not. And this is a map of gypsy moth management zones or infested areas within the United States that I also found online at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. You can actually find a more interactive and much more detailed map at the APHIS website. So that's the address on the left hand bottom corner there, aphis.usda.gov. There's a fantastic map there. And you can see on this map that Massachusetts where Gypsy moth was first introduced um, as a as kind of someone who is going to breed it and produce silk in a efficient and um, uh, less expensive way. Unfortunately, the caterpillars got out and they started feeding on trees in the neighborhood, and the rest is history. But that's where it started, and it, obviously it spread to several states, especially around the Great Lakes region and into the eastern seaboard, obviously. So you can see all the infested areas. So next I wanted to show you a few slides from a fantastic presentation, Forests Under Attack, the History, Dispersal and Management of Gypsy Moth. And you can see this was brought to you by the Invasive Species Center um, with uh, David uh, Decut. Oh, you know what? I'm going to mess up his name, so I'm not going to try it. <laughs> And also Taylor Scar from Natural Resources Canada. And I know that the Ontario Ministry of um, Natural Resources and Forests also contributed content uh, with Dan Rowlinson as well in this presentation. So I wanted to show you a few slides from this, but if you get a chance, do go on to their website, invasivespeciescenter.ca. And they have a lot of their webinars that are recorded. This one is from summer 2020. Do check it out. It's a really fantastic um, webinar presentation. So you can see from this slide, um, from this presentation, the history of gypsy moth, and you can see how it was first detected in Ontario 
1969. We started to see outbreaks in 1981. And then since then, there's been outbreaks, say, like every 5, 10, 15 years. Um, and you can see the peaks there at, at those times, 85, 1991, 2002, 2008. I remember 2002 is particularly severe. Um, and I have some pictures from that as well. And you can see, you know, somewhere between 50,000 and 350,000 hectares of defoliation was actually uh, mapped out in the province of Ontario by the ministry. And then we come to 2020, where we're seeing as much as 586,000 hectares of defoliation. So this is actually what that chart looks like now so it's it's quite a significant population of gypsy moth we have not seen numbers like this in ontario before so this is pretty significant for a lot of us so again here's another screenshot from uh, david and taylor's presentation and you can see this was gypsy moth infestation getting to be some, you know, moderate to severe levels um, in the southern Ontario region. This is from 2019. And then here's 2020. So pretty incredible how this insect really built its numbers up last year in, in 2020. Unfortunately, there are quite a few hosts of gypsy moth. Gypsy moth is, is not that fussy. It loves oak, of course, but there's many other species, including maple, beech, birch, poplar, willow, aspen, um, lo lots of plants. And it can also be found feeding on white pine. And we're seeing that more because we've got such high numbers even Colorado spruce and jack pine. And again, it's a lot to do with the fact that we've just got such a severe outbreak that when we have such large numbers of insects, they kind of get desperate and they may not have enough host material to feed on that they really prefer. And so they have to make do with um, some secondary plants that they, they wouldn't normally prefer to feed on, but they, they will feed on. Thank goodness they don't feed on every tree species that we have in Ontario. So that's good news. So if they can't find a food source, they, they will actually uh, die. Um, but unfortunately, there, there are a lot of species of trees that they do like. Now, 2020 was really hot and dry. So um, it's kind of something to note in terms of both the environmental conditions, plant health, tree health itself. Um, so a lot of trees can withstand defoliation. They can withstand defoliation, you know, two to three times, and then they, they start to really suffer, especially deciduous trees, right? They'll reflush out. But when you think about when it's hot and dry, then it gets a lot tougher for them to be able to reflush and reflush again. So some of these environmental factors kind of compound on top of the insect defoliation. And you've got to think about this in, in kind of layers of compounding factors, why some trees are really, really struggling and other trees maybe aren't struggling as much. And we certainly had varying conditions in terms of those hot, dry conditions. So some areas, um, you know, east of Toronto saw like several weeks where there was absolutely no rain, which has a big impact on plant health on its ability to refoliate after a defoliation event. And then also it puts that kind of stress on that plant for the seasons to come too, right? It's gonna reduce its vigor a little bit for the years to follow as well. Whereas um, in the Toronto and west of Toronto, I mean, they certainly saw weeks of, of no rain, but they seem to catch a lot more breaks than we did east, east of the GTA. So yes, it's true, gypsy moth larvae can actually feed on spruce, notably on Colorado spruce. I've seen this, this is a, an image that I took. Unbelievable. That's uh, something we wouldn't really expect. We see them more on deciduous hosts. 
and sometimes you can see absolutely no symptoms of feeding damage whatsoever. So I would encourage you to lift up branches of Colorado spruce, especially in 2021. Anytime you're monitoring and you think gypsy moth is in the area, you have to look on the undersides of branches, especially during the day or out during the day. And they actually kind of, they're largely inactive during the day. They're more of a nocturnal larval insect. So they'll be kind of sleeping or, or resting on the undersides of branches and the undersides of twigs during the day, and that's where you can find them. So again, another screenshot from uh, Taylor and David's presentation from the Invasive Species Centers. This is a really great shot of the gypsy moth life cycle. Um, and we're gonna start out with the adult stage, which we saw in uh, full force in mid-July last year in 2020. I remember this because it was my birthday and of course COVID birthdays in 2020 are outside and we were just completely inundated with gypsy moth males flying through um, in between houses and, and almost like a wind tunnel and the moths just showing up. There was like another moth showing up into the backyard every like 30 to 60 seconds. It was kind of crazy. Um, but the adults will emerge in, in mid to late August and lay their eggs and those eggs will overwinter until the following spring um, and the larvae will hatch. They won't all hatch at once. They'll hatch over a period of, of some weeks, usually starting at about the time the trilliums are blooming and then they'll be finishing up feeding and starting to pupate anywhere from mid-June mid -June, and then uh, finishing up in mid-July and summer. So here's a gypsy moth male and uh, adult, obviously you can see, see his antennae, they, they're so plumose is what we call it. So there's a really large surface area on the antennae and you can actually see, um, you can see that in this picture and they, they have that because they are looking for females, right? The, the point of their whole adult life is to find a mate and to reproduce. They actually don't feed. And so by having that extra surface area on their antennae, they can actually pick up the chemical pheromones that the female moths are producing, those sex pheromones, and they just, they're just they more successful at it. So they've evolved to have these plumose antennae. So if you're ever looking at a moth, and it has these plumose antennae, then chances are you're probably looking at the male. So because they are susceptible to those sex pheromones, of course, we've um, science has, has been able to develop uh, synthetic sex pheromones, and there is one for gypsy moss. There's a, a trap that's used, and that's that green milk carton trap that you can see in this slide here. And although it's very good at attracting the adult gypsy moth males, it's it's just it's not enough so it's more about uh, a pheromone trap is going to indicate that gypsy moth is in the area but it's it's not really effective in terms of reducing numbers it's, it's not a pest management practice you would have to have hundreds probably of gypsy moth pheromone traps in, a, in an area such as like an acre or a hectare to, to really be effective at reducing numbers, which is which is not really feasible, right? And then you'd have to change up those traps on a regular basis too, because they would probably get full. So here's the gypsy moth female. So the male was, was brown and obviously he can fly and the gypsy moth adult females, they actually cannot fly. And so they usually will crawl from their pupil case. They won't get very far on the tree usually and then they'll be intercepted by a male. They'll copulate and then she'll be able to lay fertilized eggs and you can see her egg mass right there on the bark but she's quite different she's quite white with those wavy dark lines on her back a very simple antennae which you can barely see in this photo but the females really do stand out they're easy to see and it's because they can't fly that gypsy moth has spread relatively slowly um, not in terms of the natural spread of gypsy moth, it's been relatively sl slow in North America. It's it, the, the long-term transport is more where people are taking objects or perhaps it's even on vehicles where we've got egg masses 
on those objects or vehicles and then they're driving you know across state or across country it's staying there and those eggs are hatching the following spring so this is actually an image from a tree across the street from me and you can see all those adult female gypsy moth um, there there's just a tremendous number of them and i i have not seen these types of numbers in in my lifetime so it's it's quite extensive so you can see we're, we're definitely in a unusually high population and peak for gypsy moth um, and just as a side note yeah you can probably notice that chain that's around the base of the tree um, the 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 family that used to live here their their son had a dog and his name was Cujo and Cujo was a pretty big dog and he was a pretty robust dog and pretty strong and so if they wanted to have him outside in the front yard they had to basically chain him up or he, he could get away so uh, anyways I just thought that was kind of funny because people are saying what is that chain around there so that's from Cujo so if you look up in the same tree there's uh, a lot of pupil cases so males would have had emerged out of there as well as females um, and you can see the females didn't get very far before they were intercepted by males and then they laid their egg mass quite near where they pupated so when you're out monitoring for egg masses of gypsy moth look up and I mean way up you might actually want to have some binoculars with you if you're scouting around uh, larger trees uh, definitely in the forest uh, you're gonna find unfortunately gypsy moth egg masses you know quite a ways up the, the bowl of the tree and so don't underestimate just by looking at kind of human height for egg masses because you're probably going to miss a lot of those egg masses in your counts and then look down they will lay their eggs on a tree as low as right at the soil or mulch line this is on a European beach that's on my front lawn and those egg masses aren't there anymore but um, I thought this makes a really good shot and they really they can really blend in with that buff color to them right buff. so when we do see outbreaks sometimes we see what I call non-discriminant egg laying so they will lay their eggs on all kinds of hosts that they would never feed on in a million years like balsam fir and hemlock and they're really not likely to, to feed on or be able to complete their life cycle but this is kind of where they landed this is where they mated and so this is where they laid their eggs but those larvae when they hatch they'll be crawling up the tree and catching a wind for for dispersal because that's not a suitable host so here's a fresh egg mass from last summer and you can see that sort of buffy hairiness so that actually all those little brown hairs those buff colored hairs are actually hairs from the abdomen of the adult female gypsy moth so she'll actually as she after she lays her eggs up against the bark she'll actively cover the egg mass with her body hairs just before she dies and so it's a, a protective mechanism and it works really really well and probably has some insulating properties as well it keeps predators away it camouflages the egg mass and it works really nicely so I've scraped these off and you can see the eggs um, inside a, just a, a little white cup and then you can see the the buffy hairs on there as well so uh, the egg masses are around two to three centimeters long sometimes they can be a little longer or a little shorter um, and it's crazy there can be hundreds and hundreds of eggs in some of those egg masses and then after the winter they turn this lighter grayer brown color and um, they're usually a lot harder to see so this is something you kind of got to train your eye for to to look for this kind of washed out color looking egg mass um, just just for monitoring and scouting purposes so again scraping off egg masses collecting them some people will double bag them and 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 put them in the garbage 
Um, others will soak them for 48 hours in soapy water. And these are ways of, of getting rid of those eggs and making sure that they're not out there in the landscape viable, ready to hatch in the spring. So I personally have collected all the egg masses on my property, but I know there's going to be larvae that blow in from neighboring trees um, and also neighboring you know, forested areas. We just happen to be near forested areas. So I know I have a lot of gypsy moth that'll probably come in to my yard anyways, and, and we're going to have to treat. Um, but yeah, it's important to know that there are a lot of eggs within each one of those egg masses. Um, and they're, one of the things that we're looking at is dormant oil treatments to see if a dormant oil application can actually reduce the amount of viable eggs or reduce the amount of larvae that successfully hatch and emerge out of those egg masses. So we're looking at doing some efficacy trials because this is not a labeled insecticide use uh, right now as it stands in Canada. This use isn't on any pesticide label. So it's something that we're, we're going to be looking at. But egg mass collection, um, you know, a lot of people say, is, is this even worth it? You know, it depends on how, how much time you want to invest in doing that. But to me, I mean, I, I, I personally think it's a good idea. It's something that I'm doing. I encourage all my neighbors to do. Um, I'll help my neighbors do it. And so it's kind of that education program because most people wouldn't even notice that they have all of these egg masses, right? And they're not going to really notice until caterpillars are landing on them when they're outside um, walking their dog or, or playing with their kids. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think egg mass collection uh, and and disposal is worth it, but the more people that can do it in an area or the larger an area that you can actually remove egg masses from is going to be a lot more beneficial. And just to note that if you are collecting egg masses and disposing them in whatever means uh, is a really good idea to wear a face mask because those little hairs, if you breathe in, and it, it you know, if you just collect a few egg masses, is probably not going to bother you. But if you're collecting egg masses over a series of hours, then potentially you would breathe in more and more of those little hairs, those body hairs from the females, and they can be allergens to a lot of people and the respiratory system. Um, causing mild irritations to sometimes even moderate and severe irritations. So masks are pretty easy to come by right now thanks to COVID. So it's something that I would encourage you to wear a mask if you are collecting egg masses. So those egg masses will be hatching in the spring, usually late April to early May, they'll start to hatch. And we usually notice it's around the time that the trilliums are blooming just kind of loosely. But again, they don't all hatch at the same time. They hatch over a period of, of multiple weeks. Sometimes there, it's almost like there's an early group and there's a later group. So it's something you really have to monitor for um, over a period of, of at least three or four weeks. And you can see the larvae that have just emerged out of these egg masses. And then here's the same larvae under a dissecting microscope. So this is 40 times magnification under my dissecting microscope that you can see there. See how big their heads are and see how fuzzy they are. So you can't see those blue and red dots yet with the early instar larvae. But that kind of big head and the way they're so fuzzy, to me, that's that's that family Arabidae. That's that's the the Lymantria kind of caterpillar look. So that's Gypsy Moth. So the first in star, if they're lucky enough to hatch on a desirable host, they'll actually begin feeding on that host. Um, if there's too many of them or if it's just not the right host for them, they'll actually travel, they'll walk up the tree, spin a little thread and, and catch the wind. And they're so light, they're so hairy, they catch the wind really er er easily. And the larvae can actually disperse up to something like a half a kilometer. So they'll definitely be on my trees this spring from the forest that's nearby. And then what you'll start and see is at the very beginning of that larval period, those early instar larvae or just newly hatched larvae, they have small mouths, small mandibles, right? 
and so they're just eating small little bits and they're making kind of small holes in leaves um, usually towards you know mid to late May and then getting into June definitely in early June we're starting to see them you know settle find a, a suitable host and then start feeding so this is typical first instar early instar gypsy moth damage and it's really interesting that gypsy moth can actually consume a meter square of leaf area over their entire larval lifetime that's incredible so if you turn that leaf over you'll see the, on the underside a little early instar gypsy moth larva so it's always good when you're monitoring the top side of the leaf the undersides of the leaf looking at the, the bark on the tree the lower sides like all those places that that insects could hide if you're if you're seeing damage and you're not finding the insect you kind of have to be a, a, a bit of a detective about it and on european beach um, they they love beach as well in my experience so here's gypsy moth larvae this is probably a second or maybe third instar larva starting to to do some more noticeable damage and then as they get bigger they start to develop those paired blue dots followed by the paired red dots and uh, become more noticeable as as they get bigger um, and they get more detailed and, and more colorful as well so there's quite a few pesticides that are registered for gypsy moth in Canada as you can see by this chart so you can pause on this chart and have a look um, to compare what products you might want to be using for this pest and you'll have to look at the label to see whether it's a product that's um, available to use in nursery production in outdoor ornamentals usually is the language or nursery production whether it's something that is available to be used in the landscape and of course in Ontario um, we have a cosmetic pesticide ban so you have to look at the allowable list for insecticide products there is an exemption for trees so because gypsy moth is a pest of trees there is an exemption um, for spraying trees where the insect could be doing you know significant damage and uh, be a significant effect on plant health so do have a look at the um, the ministry's website and at uh, ontario.ca forward slash pesticides but anyways here's here's the products that are registered a lot of um, nursery producers as well as landscapers will be using btk products that second row there in the table so these are biological insecticides they're actually a bacteria that are ingested by the gypsy moth larvae and then they cause a chemical reaction essentially they cause the inside of the the gut to kind of explode so obviously you know within a day or so the larvae will stop feeding and then within a few days after that the larvae will be dead we also have permethrin products that are available the 3a products imidan is 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 registered um, mimic conserve and success is another product and it's kind of a, a natural light product uh, treason which is an injectable and then there is the mpv virus that is actually registered but it's not usually a, a product that we have in great stock in canada it's it's hard to rear out you can imagine any um, pathogens that are very specific to a very specific insect it's hard to rear them out and have enough to use them on a commercial basis but these are the products and if you want to find your own uh, for your own information or to look at those labels so all you have to do is write the words or, or key in the words PMRA label search into your web browser and you're going to come up with Health Canada PMRA homepage and you can search gypsy moth in here or you can search a specific product um, and there's also a label search app that you can download that they've come out with as well so check this out but this is the resource that you want if you're looking up pesticide labels then this is the resource that you want and the app is is, is pretty good as well and you can save labels on both the app and also the the desktop version and that's where you would enter your your search word 
So this is a, a photo showing some different instars. There's about six instars of, of uh, development for gypsy moth larvae. The males actually have one less instar. Um, when you think about that, the, the males for a lot of insects are smaller because they don't have to have a big enough body and enough food and resources to produce eggs. And so they can be a little bit smaller. They'll feed over a period of about six to eight weeks. And so um, we'll see, you know, sometimes we'll see various kind of larval stages. And then you can see in this image, those two little guys here, those are actually cast skins of the gypsy moth larvae. So the larvae grow by expanding and then they'll shed their skin just like a snake and then they'll emerge out of that skin, cast it behind them and then start feeding again, growing and growing and growing again until they get too large for that skin. They'll shed that skin, move along, keep feeding and uh, that's how they move from one instar to the next. And it's called molting when they shed their skin. And then when they get to be about an inch long or two and a half centimeters long, you'll see that they have this yellow head capsule, whereas in the rest of this picture, they're, they have black head capsules. So it's good to know once you see that yellow head capsule, that is time that your BTK, so that's your biological insecticide, like your Dipel and Bioprotec and those types of products. Once they develop that ye yellow head capsule, they're not susceptible to to eating that BTK anymore and so you'll have to move on to another insecticide like the permethrins or some of the other products that were mentioned there including success which is spinosad so gypsy moth they will really during the day they'll they'll kind of rest or or sleep and especially during the heat of the day. So you'll find them actually more feeding on the canopy as very early instar larvae during the day. And then once they, they, they get to be, you know, a little bit larger, they'll, they'll feed at night and they'll kind of hide in different places during the day. So um, they'll be in little cracks and crevices on the bark, or in this case on, on burlap, um, they could even be on flagging tape. So you really got have to, to really look around closely um, once those larvae do hatch in June and July, and obviously especially. So that's the real larval period that you have to really look around to, to find out where the larvae are. And, you know, we're out during the day and we're out scouting during the day. So it makes it a little bit easier to find them. And it doesn't mean that none of the larvae will be in the canopy. There will definitely be larvae in the canopy as well. Um, but a lot of them will come down to, to the, the main trunk and some of these other places. So what people will do sometimes is they'll make tree skirts out of burlap. And this is from Meadowood Tree Service here in Ontario. I stole this picture from their Instagram site. I don't think that they would mind. And what they do is they'll kind of attract these nice places for the larvae to hide in during the day. And you can actually trap the larvae. So you could remove the larvae or squish the larvae or vacuum the larvae off of this tree, shop back, you know, to try to reduce numbers. And it's something that you'll have to do on a daily or perhaps even twice a day kind of basis. But this is a, a, a physical or kind of cultural management practice that some homeowners can employ. Um, it's obviously very time and labor intensive, so it's more like a homeowner strategy. Um, landscape service providers will not have the time or be able to do this kind of a management strategy. For those of you that are homeowners, this is something that you can do to reduce larval populations on your trees again during June and July. And then, you know, when I teach scouting, I always say, have a look at your, your trees, your shrubs, the foliage, and, you know, hold it up to the sky because it's amazing what you can see, um, uh, a, a, you know, when you compare it to the backdrop of the lighting of the sky, you can see a lot of shadows of things that you wouldn't necessarily notice. 
And uh, it's easy to do this when we're out scouting trees because the trees that we're scouting are taller than us. And so we can sort of peek through the canopy and see the shadows of, of things that we wouldn't normally be able to reach or see. And in this case, these are the shadows of gypsy moth larvae. So there's a larvae on the left hand side and on the right hand side is a, a molt, uh, a recently shed skin of that gypsy moth larvae. So gypsy moth peaks somewhere around every seven to ten years. Um, this is an image from the early 2000s where we had quite an outbreak of gypsy moth in southern Ontario in some areas and uh, quite a lot of defoliation from it. So a lot of deciduous trees, like I said before, can handle defoliation two, maybe three times before they really impacts their ability, their resources and their, their capability to put out yet another set of foliage. And if it's hot and dry, that's going to reduce their ability to be able to um, recover and refoliate from any defoliation. So again, don't forget that those things go hand in hand. Site conditions, how healthy the tree was in the first place, if there's been any construction or injury, to the root system, which is the main source, of course, of carbohydrate storage, as well as in, in the, the trunk of the tree. Whereas evergreen hosts, of course, of gypsy moth, if they're defoliated, a lot of their carbohydrate storage is in the foliage. So if they're defoliated, there goes a lot of their carbohydrate storage that they would need as an energy source to, to be able to grow maintain themselves and potentially refoliate so it's a lot more impactful and they obviously cannot recover to the same extent so here's a laden star larvae they get to be about four to six centimeters long which is which is quite long especially when they land on you and you maybe didn't notice and they're crawling out of your shirt later on when you you come home i'm sure that's happened to uh more than a few people not just me um so uh, they, they can be quite large and, well, if you're eating a whole meter of, of surface area of leaves, that, that's quite big. So anyways, they're one of our largest caterpillars and the females, again, are larger than the males. So if it's like an exceptionally really large, long, fat caterpillar, it's probably a female gypsy moth that you're looking at. So they'll pupate so that the larvae will actually become short and stout. It'll happen over a period of, of a day or so, and then they'll develop that, that pupil case, and they'll be, of course, reorganizing their tissue inside and becoming the adult moth. And which brings us back to the beginning of our story where I started. So interesting. Um, that the gypsy moth egg masses, so I, I've actually done some some really small little trials just to see if you bring a gypsy moth egg mass into your home, you know, how long it takes for those eggs to hatch. And, and where I was going with this was, you know, if you have a gypsy moth egg mass on your Christmas tree, you know, how long does it take before you have to worry about larvae hatching? And all of the samples that I, I brought in at room temperature, which was a pretty good 20, to 21 degrees Celsius. It took them all at least four weeks to start hatching and major hatch kind of started at the five week period or so. So that's good for Christmas trees. There's not too many people that would have Christmas trees in their house longer than five weeks or should I say real live Christmas trees. So so that's that's pretty good. And even still, they're going to dry out and they're not going to be able to complete their life cycle, especially on something like Fraser fir or, or balsam fir for that matter. So but the other thing that happened when I brought in these gypsy moth egg masses is these little parasitoid wasps were emerging. Now, the. Uh, so here's an image of the wasp and you can see. So these were introduced um, parasitoid wasps. So uh, I'm going to try here. So the Owen Sirtis cuvene, and they were actually introduced as a biocontrol for another insect. And interestingly enough, 
according to my research on bugguide.net, um, they were also found emerging out of spotted lanternfly eggs in 2017. So I'm really, really encouraged to, to hear that. Um, that's another insect that we're battling in, in uh, North America as well, and uh, we're, we're certainly very worried about here. So, but here they are, and I had tremendous numbers of them that were emerging out of the egg masses that I brought in for my little, um, my little house trial that I did last fall. So I read that the females overwinter in leaf litter and emerge in the spring to lay eggs, but there was a, a lot that emerged out of my egg masses. So I'm encouraged to hear, to, to see that. So there is some pretty good levels of biological control and populations of parasitoids and um, parasites, pathogens already going on. And this is something that the Ministry of Natural Resources also noticed last year that they did see pretty good populations of that. Uh, here's another, you can see this little white cocoon here. So this is um, probably a pupil case of a, a parasitoid, probably a, again a parasitoid wasp. Well, the, the, the immature stage actually would have been inside the gypsy moth and then it emerged out to pupate into an adult. So it's, it's, it's still basically a parasite and not nearly as significant as the other um, parasitoid wasp that I showed you. What we significantly are really counting on for 2021 is that we get some good rainfall during the larval period. See, in 2020, it was very dry during the larval developmental stage. And so because of that, a lot of pathogens that would normally exist because of dew events and rainfall events, they just, it wasn't the right conditions for them. So we did not see very much um, diseases on the larval stage of gypsy moth in 2020, whereas in past years where we've had outbreaks, we've usually seen pretty good um, pathogen, you know, infection because we've had enough rainfall to sort of support those populations of fungi and also viruses. And that's what this image is of, actually, it's of the early 2000s and uh, all the different pathogens, the gypsy moths that were not able to complete their life cycle because they were killed in the late instar larval stage by these pathogens. So there's a couple of pathogens that we're counting on this year. Uh, one is a fungus, Entomophaga mamega. You can see here on the left-hand side, and then there's the, the fungus actually growing on the killed body of the gypsy moth larva. And then there's also the virus, right, that uh, we sort of spoke about early, earlier. And it's interesting how you can see the difference between the fungal killed gypsy moth larva and the virus killed gypsy moth larva. So they, they look quite differently. And it's kind of nice that the virus killed one is in upside down V. So that makes it, I don't know, kind of obvious to see. So the fungus was actually introduced from Japan about 100 years ago, according to my reading, and the spores will spread from infected larvae to infected larvae with rain and, and wind events and stuff like that. The spores will also drop to the ground and they'll persist in the soil for as much as 10 years. So that's fantastic. So we're really, we're counting on that. We're counting on some rainfall events during the larval stage this year to catch up to our gypsy moth caterpillar population. And then the NPV, the, the virus that, that we were talking about earlier, um, it's actually registered as an insecticide in Canada, but as you can imagine, trying to rear out the virus on a specific host like gypsy moth is really hard to do, so there's, there's not a lot of supply. Um, they do use this product as an aerial application, and it's for that purpose. Um, and it's really the most effective during first and second instar of the gypsy moth larva. And it's really interesting that the virus, it's really neat. It's contained within this kind of inclusion protein body. And so the, the larvae will eat that whole kind of inclusion body and then it basically dissolves it. And then the virus kind of releases out of that into the gut 
and then it can obviously penetrate the gut wall and then start that cycle obviously of, of, of killing its host and, and then it can replicate and then be another source of virus to, to other nearby larvae and it's usually a rapid death. So during their presentation, uh, David and, and Taylor's presentation, Invasive Species Center for the History of Jitsi Moth, they were mentioning that Silvar um, is, is actually reformulating this product from a powder into a liquid and hoping to get this product out and available for, for some people to use um, to try to, again, sort of get that biocontrol process going and help things along in this, this peak year. Um, I'm not sure where they are with that, but uh, I, uh, I hope that they've, they've been successful. And that basically wraps things up. So in terms of integrated pest management for gypsy moth, we're looking at a lot of monitoring activity, a lot of scouting. Uh, you've got Bug Finder to help you with images. You can, you can show that to other people. You can tell other people about Bug Finder. You can refer to this presentation for sure. Um, but egg mass removal, um, if you have the resources, the time to do it, then I would encourage people to do it. Um, I would encourage everyone around you to do it as much as possible, where that's even possible. I know a lot of people are going to be relying on BTK applications, so that it biological control insecticide that's actually a bacteria. This is a commercially available product. You can look at that chart again for all the products that, that contain BTK. It's very effective, very effective, but it's one product that you're going to want to spray during the evening hours. It's a lot more effective if you spray it during the evening since, again, remember those larvae feed at night. So if you spray it in the morning, it's going to dry out. Um, potentially the sunlight can get at it, so it's not going to be as effective once nighttime rolls around. Whereas if you can spray during the evening, it's fresh there on the leaves. The larvae are going to consume it nice and fresh, that bacteria suspension, and they're going to eat it. And you're going to have definitely the most successful um, program if you can spray it during the evening hours. Much, much better than spraying it in the morning. And then, of course, once they get to be too big, you can use permethrin, spinosad, and some of those other products as a larval application. We're hoping for the natural spread of those pathogens that are out in the environment. We're hoping for some, some uh, rain events during the larval period to support those, those pathogens, the virus and the fungus. And uh, for those of you that are homeowners and you want to protect some high value trees, again, you can use burlap skirts and remove larvae, you know, on a daily basis or destroy larvae and reduce populations that way. So this has been the Gypsy Moth and the Landscape presentation. And I'm Jennifer Llewellyn, the Nursery and Landscape Specialist with OMAFRA. And that's my email address if you have any questions. And thank you so much for listening. And please do share this presentation, share this link with others that you think might be interested.